Where's Joseph? Joseph, if you had him walk out without the money, this whole room would have re No, it was really uh, made me realize how all in our imaginations were with you, were there. You know, it's such a magical thing that we're all doing in all different ways. And, and you know, I was thinking, Charlie, and I mean, f to go from Philadelphia to Paris to Lord Byron, you know, to to Cork or wherever he was supposed to be, right? <laughs> and then to have Aaron kind of sing us all through it, it's great. And. Um, Yes, I am one of the founding members, and I. But even when I was asked to be a member in 2008, I had done quite a bit. I was a filmmaker and a screenwriter, and had published two books. But when Malachi McCord called me to invite me to be on the board and to be one of the founding members, he said, "Mary Pat, you're a woman, right?" And the way he said it, I actually had to say, "Yeah, yeah, I'm a woman. I am a woman," and, and that's what he wanted because there were no women on the board for a long time. Ashley Davis, but she was based in uh, in Kansas City. And now we have a woman president, two in a row. We're just like Ireland. I'm Mary Robinson. She's Mary McAleese, you know, so. <laughs> but um, uh, I think the idea of having a community to share artistic um, you know, and then I'm looking at Kathleen Walsh Darcy, without whom the Irish writers would not exist. And uh, and then I have to have a personal shout out to Karen Daly, not only for her wonderful work on the board and all that she's done, but for me personally, because I got stuck when I was writing Irish Above All, which is the third part of the trilogy, and I begged her. She came and helped me as an editor, as a typist, as a consultant as a hand holder and I, I think that's what Irish writers and artists gives each other that way Sarah and and uh, where's Jennifer all everybody I mean I, I, I know once you start saying names it's bad because you miss somebody Sheila all of us here that are trying to do this and the reason why it's so funny to, not funny to write it to talk about Martin Scorsese many Okay, so you know me as a, no a historical fiction and novelist, but before that, I was a screenwriter and worked in, in film and television. And um, that's because of Martin Scorsese. So I was just in Cannes, yes. And I, the good news was I got to walk on the red carpet, right? The bad news, right. The bad news is the security guards are really mean. And so when I tried to take a selfie to prove that I was on the red carpet, I only got my hair, just this much of my hair. And he kept telling me, go, go, go. And of course, it's these gorgeous models. I mean, you could go through a whole thing about objectification of women and stuff, but I figured not that day, not, you know, not when I was going to be on the red carpet. So I said to him, no, no, I can't go while, you know, this woman's having her picture taken. Finally, I had to go. So the red carpet is very long, but the steps are even longer, very wide, and the railings are very far apart. So I don't know about anyone else, but I can't walk up those many stairs without a railing, right? So I'm walking, and I thought, what am I going to do? And there was a couple ahead of me, but there was a single man behind them, and I said, hello, and I took his arm. <laughs> Now, in most of my stories, a, a chance encounter like that leads to a lifelong friendship. No, he got me up the stairs and then was very glad to get away. But the fact that Martin Scorsese, who I met when I was studying to be a nun in 1965, was there and that I was there too was amazing. And Maria, I notice your shirt, Providence. I was a sister of Providence. And I figure in my life, Providence has really acted. I did have one kind of blimp. I was invited by Providence College to give a whole day-long seminar on Scorsese and talking about the Catholic imagination, and, which is all true, sacramentality, and I was ready. And they were actually paying, I'm going to say the number, $2,500, which is about 200, you know, 2,000 more than I've gotten for any um, speaking engagement. And I got COVID. And I was saying, all right, God or whoever, what, what does sense does this make? You know, so anyway. 
So um, Providence has, has acted in my life. And to be at Cannes, and the movie is fantastic, uh, Killer of, of the Flower Moon. It's the story of the Osage Indians in the 1920s who, um, because they found oil on their reservation, were the richest people per capita in the world. And they were assigned white guardians who proceeded to murder them. Husbands murdered their wives. I mean, it was terrible. And this is the story of how they were brought to justice. And Apple was the, was the um, uh, financer, were the producers. So they had a lot of money. And they brought about 20 members of the Osage tribe to Cannes. And the best moment, and they, the chiefs had their blankets, and, and the, they, they had all been in the movie, or the woman next to me um, did the art direction. She gave me this beautiful necklace, you know. And um, so they weren't just kind of extras or anything. They were really involved in the movie. And the one younger guy stood on the red carpet, and he raised his fist, and he gave a war hoop that you, I mean, it was just fantastic. So it was a great experience. And um, for me, the odd way that I was connected to him and being there, and also he is a true artist, you know, really, most of his films, until he made, met Leonardo DiCaprio, had never made any money. I mean, he was doing movies. He's often said he wouldn't mind doing a movie that people wanted to go to see. It just didn't work out that way, you know. He won, and so anyway, and a lot of this book is about that moment in the early 1970s when all of a sudden these young guys and, you know, women in some ways, but the women were there. They were there as the editors. They were there as the, as the screenwriters. Even now, I mean, I finally got to direct a feature film, but I think it's like 0.01%. So there are still areas that need to be watched. You know, we've got to get Malachi on the case about finding women. But um, that he was able then to have this moment. And after the movie was shown, the movie is a masterpiece. It's so beautifully done. It's tough. But the whole 3,000 people stood up, and they applauded and applauded. And he really was overwhelmed. And, um, and later, he was saying to me, he said, you know, the Osage are Catholic. I go, well, I mean, I'm not saying that's why the movie's good, but you know, it's probably part of it. So um, anyway, it was a great experience. And, I, I, and he then gave an interview in the New York Times saying that the message of the movie is this is where white supremacy began. And there's a line in the movie, you'd get, uh, you'd, you'd get in more trouble for shooting a dog than killing an Indian. And he said it hasn't changed that much as far as white supremacy goes. So I hope the movie's coming out in October. I hope it'll generate some conversation and some um, thought. And um, so anyway, and then he, and then afterwards we went to a party. Are you ready? At the chateau where they made to catch a thief. With them. yeah, I know. And I had been to the Grace Kelly Library earlier. It's in Monaco, uh, and he, she brought a lot of Irish books. And I thought. What is going on here? You know, what is happening to me? Because how did I get there? You know, Ryanair, cheap. And where I was staying in the only hotel for 100 euros within, you know, 30 miles. So anyway, but it was a great experience. And oh, the other funny thing, well, is, so this book I first did in 1990. And the reason why I did it was, all right, I'm going to back up about the nun, and then I'll jump forward. So. I was with Martin Scorsese at a uh, opening for um, the Rolling Thunder Bob Dylan uh, documentary. It was about four or five years ago. And he looked at me and he said, St. Mary of the Woods, like that. St. Mary of the Woods. And he said, I'll never forget that name. And I thought to myself, is that why he answered my letter? St. Mary of the Woods. It was the, the poetics of it. You know, St. Mary of the Woods, Indiana. And as a New York little Italy guy, he was always fascinated by the Midwest and about the country, St. Mary of the Woods. So we were laughing. I mean, it was almost 60 years ago. And what happened was, Martin, my husband, who you all know, you may wonder why he's not here. He's in Derry. We spent the summer, last summer in Derry. And in September, Martin said, I'm not going back. He said, America is not the country I came to in 1980, and Ireland isn't the country I left. So he's there, and I get to see him every once in a while, you know? <laughs> I go back and forth, but anyway. 
So um, I've been with him in dairy, and, and um, of course, one of the big things that happened in dairy is Dairy Girls. And I, when I interviewed Marty for the update, I mentioned Dairy Girls to him. And it, but it hadn't, because the first episode of the third season of Dairy Girls, the nun goes into the video store and the clerk says, I have your Scorsese that you ordered. <laughs> so I told him that. So fast forward to like November, when it landed in the States and he did watch it, and he was being interviewed at some big event, and they said, what are you watching now? You know, what classic movies do you like? And he said, Dairy Girls, I love The Nun. <laughs> so maybe it wasn't the name St. Mary the Woods, maybe he just likes nuns, you know. So Martin always likes the statistic. When I graduated from high school in 1962, Mary was school for girls. A hundred in our class, 14 became nuns, right? In 1962, there were 200,000 women in religious life in the United States. Now I think there's 20,000, and most of them are over 90. So uh, someday, I mean, I did write a novel about its special intentions. As Frank McCourt used to say, you can buy the damn book and read it yourself for the story. But it isn't wh where, why it happened, what happened, how much it was feminism, how much it was brainwashing, how much it was John Kennedy and Pope John, all the combinations, I don't know. But anyway, I was at St. Mary of the Woods, and I was also going to college. And I was interested still in film and theater. And we had one nun, Sister Mary Olive, who had been an act had been a theater director. She'd gone to Catholic University that had a famous, that's where um, Walter Carr went, and um, that's where this Father Harkey, anyway, she worked in the professional theater. And she had a green room. And the green room had a couch and lamps. And when you're living in an institution where it's all fluorescent lights and naugahyde, you know, Know, to sink into a couch, it was wonderful. And she had a coffee table, and on the coffee table was a reprint of an article from Harper's Magazine about the new phenomenon of film schools. And it talked about this young student at NYU had won the first Producers Guild Student Film Award. Okay, There were only three film schools in the United States, USC, NYU, and Northwestern in Evanston. So um, I, I'm reading this article and I'm thinking, I'm an English major, but this might be a way to study film that I could do, write my senior thesis on comparing his short film to a short story of guess who, of course, James Joyce, right? So I wrote away. To, uh, I didn't because we only got one letter a week and we had no stamps. But Sister, Sister Mary Olive O'Connell had a friend, Sister Marie Denise Sullivan, in the English department, who typed the letter for me, got the stamp, and sent it off. And within a couple of weeks, we got the film. It was in one of those brown cases, you know, with the, uh, like, belt around it. So she went, the only 16 millimeter projector was in the biology department, but she had clout, so she brought it in. The two of us watched it, and it was called It's Not Just You, Murray. And a lot of it, it holds up, like he looks and speaks to the camera. You know how in Goodfellows they look to the camera, you know, Tommy two times, all that kind of stuff. It was all, it was about Little Italy. It was about a guy who was a gangster and yet trying to live a good life, which is the theme of all his movies. So um, it was great. So I wrote him a letter and asked if I could use his film and compare it to the, uh, Grace, she, because it was also about men, businessmen that are misguided, not too hard to find. So anyway, he said yes, and he started to send me these 16, 17-page letters, and they were typed on onion skin. Remember the old typing? And he would type with such energy that the periods would go through the page. And it was like a film course. He told me what books to buy. Now, I'm in St. Mary of the Woods in Indiana. However, the nun who ran the library was progressive. She was about 95 years old, but she had, you know, she'd had a life. And she would write away to um, the Gotham Bookmark and order all these books. But then he would say things like, you must go to see Hiroshima Mona Moore. And I thought to myself, doesn't he know I have to ask permission to go to the third floor to get a handkerchief, you know? <laughs> 
But it, it was a friendship. And the other interesting thing was his birthday is November 17th and mine is November 18th. And when we discovered that, it's like Providence, we thought, hmm, there's some connection here. He had studied to be a priest. And he, the whole idea of vocation is very interesting to him. I think as it is to all of us, what does that mean? Are you called to something? What is it? And how does, I mean, I, I thought it was very interesting, Charlie, when you were saying it, you can't just walk away from all this. I mean, Ireland is amazing. You know, there are places in Dublin that went from 90% church attendance on Sunday to 2%. But of course, they've got holy wells and things that they can do that are spiritual. But it, it, it is an interesting question. What do, we, what, do, what do we do now? Where does community come from? Um, so of course, he's become best friends with the pope. So he went right to the top. You know. <laughs> but he did wait for a pope named Francis and a, a Jesuit. So anyway. Um, uh, we are writing and we become friends and back and forth just by correspondence. And then I'm assigned to Providence High School in Chicago. And his first feature, Who's That Knocking at My Door, is premiered at the Chicago Film Festival. This is 1967. And my superior allows me to go. And I go to the Playboy Theater in full habit. I remember crossing the Michigan Avenue Bridge with my veil flying and everything. But also there was Roger Ebert, who was like, you know, we were all in our 20s. And he um, loved the movie. And he had a column in the Sun-Times. And he said, this is a new classic. This is the beginning of a, of a great career. And it was. It was never easy. He never had an easy time getting funding. And to do Mean Streets was, you know, people are saying, wait, you're going to make a movie about a loser in Little Italy who is obsessed with St. Francis of Assisi? You know, can you imagine pitching that to some studio? But anyway, so that became a real friendship. And um, then I left, the con I left the convent. I went to work in the poverty program. And then Nixon was elected. And it was so depressing. So I left the country and the convent. I mean, I joined the, I, I think I'm probably the oldest one here. Anyway, going through, that was the time when you would backpack through Europe. You'd go to on Icelandic airlines. And those of you who've been to my Galway Bay uh, readings know I tell the story of how I first got in touch with my Irish roots. I was very proud of being Irish. But to me, it was, you know, Cheer, cheer for old Notre Dame and um, McNamara's band and turning the river green on St. Patrick's Day. I really had no idea of the larger context. And the first place my friend and I went was London. And we found out the cheapest way to, to stay was to rent a room in somebody's house. They would put up index cards at American Express. We called her, oh, yes, she loved Americans because we paid in cash and in advance. And when we went there, it was one of those... Um, painted doorways, brass knocker. She opened the door and she said, girls, I'm such a silly Billy. I forgot to ask your names. You know, she was so interested in getting our cash. And I said, I'm Mary Pat Kelly. And my friend said, I'm Mary Beth McDonough. And she said, Irish? And we said, yes, we're Irish. Here we are. And she slammed the door in our face. <laughs> she would not rent to us. And it took an African student, Aquila Zimpasa from Zambia, who lived in Kilbourne, where African, um, Caribbean, and Irish all lived together, to explain to me that as far as she was concerned, we were, uh, you know, no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. It was really signs up there in, in London. So, um, with that night, I met Aquila because we went to a Holland Wolf concert because Holland Wolf sang in Chicago right on the corner where I lived. And um, afterwards, when we went backstage and we explained to Holland Wolf, Aquila did, how the Irish are discriminated against in, in London, he said, did anybody tell old man Daly this? Does, do they know in Chicago? But what they said seriously was, you really should get over to Ireland. You really should. And Samuel Beckett had just won, won the Nobel Prize, and there were special flights. So I went. But the interesting part, and that started my whole connection, I could go on. I really could go on, so I won't. <laughs> However, when I got back, my family had moved from Chicago to New York. So I met Martin Scorsese in the flesh for the first time after writing for all these years. And I remember we went to see Poppy um, uh, with Alan Arkin playing a Puerto Rican father. So I mean, you know, we've come a long way. So. Um, 
And I was telling him about my adventures and everything, and he had just begun doing a documentary for NEH, and it was supposed to be a serious documentary about Italian immigration, blah, blah, blah. But he ended up filming his parents, and it still is one of his best movies. It's online, you can see it, Italian American. And he said to me, what are you doing about your roots? You know, what have you, do you know your ancestors? And I, I really didn't. And it was interesting because he really got me thinking. Because believe me, in 1970, young Americans were not thinking about their ethnic background. You know, they were too, we were too busy trying to stop the war and a few other things like that. And so for me, he, and, and he really gave me, well, it was the moment. It was a moment where I, and then he said, you should really go to NYU Film School, which I did. And that started me on the whole, a whole path of becoming an artist and giving myself permission to be an artist, which I think is the hardest thing. I mean, it was years before I could write writer on my passport. I had to publish two novels before I could do that, you know. Writer, but not really, you know. <laughs> so... Then we, um, he began, I saw that he was really doing so many interesting things and working with these interesting people. And my first professional work with him was on Last Temptation of Christ. And the first time it was being done at Paramount, and my job was to assemble theologians because Paramount was getting nervous. It was, you know, it's based on The Last Temptation of Christ, a classic novel that was revered. I mean, he almost won the Nobel Prize uh, but they were nervous because it shows Jesus very human and the whole situation. So my job was to assemble theologians that would reassure Paramount that they would it would be okay to do it. And I went to um, to uh, Israel with Aidan Quinn, who was the first Jesus. So that that's another whole. That's about two or three days talk. But the point was, it got canceled and it looked like it never was going to be made. And, I th and everyone involved in it were so passionate. I thought, you know what? I should interview them. I should talk to them and find out what their thoughts were. And, and Marty said, yeah, that's a good idea. And then as we talked about it, his parents were still alive. Get his parents, you know, get... Um, Get Robert De Niro, find out what it was like to do Raging Bull. So get the cameramen, get the writers, you know, get all the people that were involved in making these movies. Because in the early days, everybody did have a sense of mission. They knew that this was someone different, that this was an artistic desire to tell stories that had not been told before. And so I did. I interviewed all of them. And, I, and they hung around. Like I was just saying, Robbie Robertson did the music for Killers of the Flower Moon. And he has a Native American background. And through Martin Scorsese's Italian immigrant stories, he started to get in touch with his Native American roots. And I think um, this new movie, real, and so Thelma Schoenmaker, who is, was the editor of his very first movie, is still his editor. A, a lot of the people that are still with him were in those early days. But the most interesting thing to me is when he and I sat down to do the updated interview, he said he still looks back, and the people that influenced him most were his father, his mother, and this father, Principe, who was a priest down at Old St. Pat's, and, and that's, where, that's where he went to school. And he had the Sisters of Mercy. And he was one of those smart kids that the nuns liked. So he had no horror stories, you know. And, um, but he's, you know, well, anyway. So a lot of that is about his Catholicism, about he talks about it, and about trying to figure out how do you take the message of Jesus and Christianity in a fallen world. And how do you deal with the fact that somebody's uncle, who's very kind and you know paying for your first communion, is also head of a mafia family? I mean, how does it? How do you work that together? And um, in fact, when he did The Irishman, and then when it premiered at um, Lincoln Center, he 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 said, "I have the same cast in the same movie I had 50 years ago with Mean Streets." So, but I think you'll really love. Uh, I think you'll really be impressed with Killers of the Flower Moon. And another one, and I'm going to read a tiny bit. Did I say everything? I said a lot. I don't even know. I've got these notes. I didn't even look at them. So um, uh, he, his, he's very devoted to Old St. Pat's, and he helped pay for the renovation of it. And it's a, 
beautiful old church, you know, and he did it in um, Gangs of New York. It's, and it's a true story of how they were attacked by the Know Nothings, the church was. And um, so he helped make a documentary about three years ago now called Oratorio. The first opera yeah, ever presented in New York City was done there by an Italian who did the libretto for Mozart. And um, so it's a beautiful documentary because they restaged it and they have the music and it, it's glorious. So when I was interviewing him about that and about why he did it and, and everything, he said this and I thought this was very beautiful to end with. He said, um, these are the stories I wanted to tell. I did try to make Hollywood style films, but they turned out differently from what people wanted to see. I guess I was trying to reflect what I was experiencing. For example, the, only sh the opening shot in The Irishman starts in a nursing home. In the past 10 to 15 years, I've spent a lot of time in those places, visiting friends and family. His wife is, has very, um, it, MS, in, in, but she was in Cannes. They had him in, her in the front row. She was there. Um, there is real pain in those places. You're sitting there and you're waiting and you are waiting and time stretches. Time takes on another meaning or no meaning at all. And you just give yourself over to what's been done for other people. So this is an 80-year-old man speaking now. Um, you may pull back at first, you may try to fight it, but you've got to give in. Give in to the situation and go with this. And try to help the best you can. Acceptance, that's the word. So that's where I am, trying to tell these stories. He's doing a new one on Jesus with the Pope. So if that's not full circle, I don't know what is. Looking back at all the influences, so many are discussed in this book, and it all hit in the right time. There were movies like On the Waterfront and East of Eden. I've maintained some wonderful connections with places from my childhood. I hosted the oratorio on PBS in St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, my own church, the place where Italian opera was first introduced to New York City in 1826 by Lorenzo de Ponte, who was the liberist, libera, librettist, thank you, librettist for Mozart. Glorious to fill that sacred space with music and to think of my parents, of Father Principe, of all the immigrants who brought the culture of the old world to the new, and to think of Charlie in Mean Streets, who stood before those vigilites in that same church asking questions I'm still trying to answer. So, and um, when my mom died, he had a mass said for me, uh, for her, and I went down to St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, and I, I just thought, and we, this book is dedicated to both of our parents, but I thought, you know, 80, he's revered in Hollywood. If you could have seen those people standing, cheering him in Cannes, the most non- you know, Catholic place where somebody, some young Italian guy is looking at vigil lights. But he really does want to figure out and tell those stories. And I think that's what all of us are trying to do, tell the stories that came to us. And it's not easy, and it's, it's difficult, and sometimes you can really give in, and then you have somebody like Karen reach out and help, or, and, or the times we've had together. And I just say, you know, let's all go forward and think maybe someday, you know, we'll be walking the red carpet and they'll all be, you know what, that's the next Brendan. The next O'Neill, we're having a red carpet. <laughs> Thank you guys very much.